Good morning, everyone. I hear the excitement in the chambers, and I'm sure it's because we are beginning our Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee. Um, I'm Sylvia Arenas, I'm your chair and uh, supervisor for District 2. Um, welcome. We're going to open up this meeting by calling it to order and establishing a quorum. So we'll start by taking roll. Vice Chairperson Samidian. Here. Chairperson Arenas. Here. You have a quorum. What did I say? <laughs> it is 10 o'clock in the morning on a, is this Thursday? <laughs> so thank you so much, Jack. Um, she, she called me on, on something, <laughs> and she's absolutely right. So we are going to move on to item two, to public comment. And uh, if there's anyone that wants to share comments about anything that's not on today's agenda, um, if you're in person and like to share public comment, we ask you to submit a yellow card for public comment. And um, since this is also a hybrid meeting, uh, those who are viewing online today and want to share public comment today you're also please raise your your virtual hand and I'm going to look at our um, clerk to see if there's any yellow cards that were we, submitted we have no speakers uh, in chambers on this item and we have no raised hands in the virtual room we have no raised hands we do not all right well we are going to move along uh, to item number three and this is approving the consent calendar um, Currently on the consent calendars, there is item 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Um, and so I'm going to look to my chair to see if you have, uh, chair, if you have any changes to the consent uh, calendar. No changes, Madam Chair. And uh, with your permission, I'm happy to move approval of the consent calendar as contained in our published agenda. And I will second that. And I, um, but before we actually um, vote, I'm going to ask our clerk if there's any other changes. There is a request from the clerk to hold item number 14 to May 18, 2023. These are minutes of the March 16, 2023 meeting. Perfect. Can we make that modification on that motion, Vice Chair? Happy to incorporate that modification. Perfect. So let's uh, call roll. Vice Chairperson Samidian? Aye. Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Motion passes. Perfect. Now we are just moving along. All right. So we are going to begin with item um, <coughs> number four. This is part of our regular agenda, and this is the annual state of the supporting housing system report. I'm going to turn it over to the Office of Supportive Housing. Thank you, Chairperson Arenas, uh, KJ Kaminsky, Deputy Director for the Office of Supportive Housing. Uh, we're looking forward to sharing some highlights from our annual supportive housing report this morning. I'd like to introduce Hillary Armstrong, Program Manager of Housing Initiatives, and Hong Kao, Program Manager for our Continuum of Care, who will lead the presentation. Thank you, KJ. Good morning, Chair and Vice Chair. My colleague Hillary and I will give an overview of our 2022 State of the Supportive Housing System Annual Report. The purpose of this report is to share our collective progress towards the goals of the community plan to end homelessness by our community members and led by the county and our partners. The overview of this report highlights our community plan progress, including crisis response and prevention, supportive housing system highlights, and finally, strong partnerships and opportunities. Our community plan to end homelessness was developed with input from our com entire community, including system partners like people with lived expertise, our nonprofit partners, housing developers, and residents in our housing programs. Our community plan focuses on three core strategies. Strategy one addresses the root causes of homelessness through system and policy change. Strategy two expands our homelessness prevention and housing programs to meet the need of our people. And strategy three improves the quality of life for unsheltered individuals to create a healthy neighborhood for all. This slide highlights the overall progress 
At the end of 2022, our system partners assisted over 9,600 people to move from homelessness to housing, which is 48% towards our goal to house 20,000 people by the end of 2025. We also know that in order for us to have a bigger impact on homelessness, we need to reduce the number of new people becoming homeless. At the end of 2022, we are at 30% reduction from our baseline, and we are on pace to hit our goal. This slide covers um, the highlights of our homelessness prevention system, which has helped close to 24,000 people to remain stably housed. And we want to note that only 3% of these households became homeless after receiving prevention assistance. This data of 20, close to 20, serving close to 24,000 people also includes COVID-19 financial assistance provided to households during the pandemic. This report also highlights the tremendous partnership of, with our network of providers, many of which are deeply rooted in the community, such as Latinas Contra Cancer, the International Children Assistance Network, or ICANN, and the Community Services Agency of Mountain View and Los Altos. Even with our progress, we know that there is more work needed to be done to prevent households from becoming homeless. Our prevention system is working to adapt, to scale to the program to be able to serve our most vulnerable residents with severe rent burden. Now I will turn it over to my colleague, Hillary. Good morning, Chair and Vice Chair. Thank you for having us this morning. We next wanted to highlight from our report the updates and changes within our crisis response system. We have been growing that system to meet the immediate need for unhoused residents in our community, and it really serves as our first stop for families and individuals experiencing homelessness to connect them with services across our supportive housing system. And we have some great new approaches that are kind of coming out of the pandemic, including um, development of service-enriched shelters, and um, I know that you will probably recall that the board approved $10 million for the development of service, new service-enriched shelters through our Challenge Grant program. These shelters are envisioned to include extensive on-site supports, including mental health and medical services and case management. And we have so far awarded two grants for projects in Palo Alto and San Jose in partnership with those cities and Life Moves. And those will increase capacity in our crisis response system by 88 units and 20, two, 204 units. We also wanted to highlight some innovations within our supportive housing system. And before I do that, I wanted to bring to your attention that this section of our report highlights the story of Kelly, one of our supportive housing clients, and her journey from an encampment through interim housing, resulting in her current placement in permanent supportive housing. And throughout that journey, Kelly has really remained a stalwart advocate and volunteer, just really helping um, her fellow unhoused residents navigate our systems and work for system improvements. Two of those improvements and innovations that we wanted to highlight are the universal application pilot. So in the past, when an individual or a family would become eligible for a housing program, they would have to possibly apply for, you know, 14 different apartments through separate applications. And in partnership with one of our property management companies and with the support of Destination Home, we have a process that has currently streamlined the application process for 10 supportive housing developments. So um, that individual can just sub submit one application and highlight all of the properties for which they're interested. After six months of that pilot, the processing time had been reduced by 31%, and our vacancy rate in those uh, permanent supportive housing sites went down from 12% to 7%. So obviously, these are key um, markers of our system that we want to have improving to make sure that more and more people are getting into housing more quickly. We'll be adding additional properties to this process over the next couple of years. We also want to highlight Willow Glen Studios on Pedro Street, 
which provides 80 units of interim housing for folks who are enrolled in a supportive housing program while they're in housing search or waiting for the construction of that uh, site to be to complete. And so Kelly, the individual highlighted in our report, spent some time at Willow Glen Studios. We've had 204 individuals who've moved into permanent housing from that site since it opened in 2021. We also want to highlight progress on the 2016 Measure A, Affordable Housing Bond. And these uh, numbers are updated as of the end of 2022. And we wanted to highlight that we have 812 million committed of the total housing bond. This pie chart shows you the breakdown. The vast majority is uh, for these 47 development and renovation projects that are resulting in 5,000 plus total units so far with nine um, coverage over nine cities, and again, our $25 million first, home, first time home buyer program. We also wanted to show you two of those Measure A funded projects that did open in 2022. We have IMAC Village, which has 118 studios and 16 one bedroom units, and 109 of those units are permanent supportive housing. We also have Vela Apartments, which includes our first site-based rapid rehousing program, where 14 units are set aside for families who are enrolled in rapid rehousing. They receive a tapering rental subsidy until they take over the unit at the conclusion of that program as a deeply affordable unit. So this is something that we're looking forward to seeing in more and more developments over the next few years. That site also has 29 permanent supportive housing units and a mix from studio all the way through three bedrooms. As we conclude, we just want to highlight that we are making progress in narrowing the gap to functional zero, which is our measure of households connected to housing versus new households who are becoming homeless. So back in 2019, before we uh, put this community plan, current community plan into place, for every one household that was housed, another two and a half became homeless. And currently where we stand at the end of 2022 is that for every one household whole, household housed, another 1.7 become homeless. So we still have much work to do, but we are making progress despite the challenges of the pandemic, our current uh, economic situation, and um, the current rental market. So we wanted to highlight that and also have it serve as a call to continued action. And with that, we're available to take any of your questions or comments. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to our clerk and um, ask if we have any members of the public who'd like to speak on this item. We have no speakers in chambers and no virtual speakers. All right. Um, look to my colleague to see if there's any questions. Vice Chair. Could we go back to slide six, please? <clears throat> yes, one moment. Let me unfreeze my computer. <laughs> when you get there, you won't be surprised that it drew my attention. Oh, yes, the challenge grants. Let me just share. Sorry, one moment. A couple of quick questions uh, through the chair, if I may. Um, the San Jose project that is referenced, is that the one that I just saw the groundbreaking for in the newspaper? Yes, that is it, at Brandon Lean. Great, and um, uh, what, could you share with us the timeline on the Palo Alto uh, project? Yes, and um, Consuelo, feel free to jump in, but the latest timeline that we have shows that uh, the project is making steady progress through the rest of this calendar year in 2024, and then I think opening toward the end of 2024, or beginning of 2025. I'm gonna ask a tactless question, as is my uh, occasional want. Um, what on earth is taking so long? I, I know the site, uh, I mean, I, you know, uh, and this conversation in Palo Alto has been underway for at least three years that I'm aware of, uh, and, it was a site that, candidly, I had in mind when Supervisor uh, Otto Lee and I stepped up and said, let's try and do some stuff that has a, a really rapid uh, time frame, and this is not a rapid time frame. 
uh, and I know there have been some impediments, and I'm, I'm just trying to understand it. I'm, I'm just, I'm obviously disappointed, but mostly I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and is there something we should anticipate or do better next time? Thank you for the question, uh, Vice Chair Samidi and Consuelo Hernandez, Director for the Office of Supportive Housing. And our understanding of the construction delays is related to the site. Um, so there is some additional infill and dirt that they have to treat. Um, the most recent change includes the um, installation of a, uh, of a wall uh, in order to protect the site. And so that has created some additional complexities with the property all of which was not planned for um, in advance. And as you know, there were delays with the announcement of the, challenge of the Home Key Award, um, and that delayed the project by at least six months. Okay. Um, well, I guess in the spirit of full disclosure, I should share with you that I'll be poking around Palo Alto and talking to council members and city staff and um, just checking in there to see if there's anything we can do to um, facilitate uh, the arrival of uh, this work. I know our, our teams here at the county, I think, you know, very much feel the sense of urgency about, about this, but, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I, we've, we've got some projects in the works where it's like, well, that's great, now the approval is ready, and it could be a year or two before financing signed off on at the state level, and they're just, um, you know, I'm not saying we don't, all need a greater sense of urgency, but just at various levels of government, it doesn't seem to me there's as much of a sense of urgency about addressing these problems. Um, you know, I think you all are acutely aware for the work you do <clears throat> that somebody who's out in the street for another two years who may or may not make it. So I, I just, um, anything I, that we can do to uh, foster a, hey, let's go, everybody, uh, uh, you know, please, I'm looking at Ms. Hernandez, who's smiling very graciously given the number of times I've said, come on, let's go, come on, let's go. Um, so I just, you know, let's see if we can spread that, that et ethic, if you will. Uh, and meanwhile, I will be uh, poking around a little on that particular project, which I'd like to see moving sooner rather than later. Thank you. If Thank I'm you, Madam Chair. If I may add one more thing through the chair, um, Supervisor Simidian, the one thing that we did offer uh, was an invitation to the problem solving table, if you will, um, because there was a, uh, the challenges with the site uh, created a $6 million construction gap. Um, and we uh, reached out to our partners at the city and offered to shift our funding around in order to close that gap um, and have um, invited them to be more open with us um, in the problem solving space so that we can help with that urgency and problem solving. Um, and we are meeting with them bi-weekly now. Great, thank you very much. Thank you all, thank you Madam Chair. W wonderful, um, really good um, point there and, and I'm glad that, that there's a lot of brainstorming and, and collaboration because that's what exactly needs to happen in order for us to solve this issue. It's not just the county um, leading on this but it's all of our partners playing a part, playing a role. Um, which brings me to my point and our role to educate our community about the work that we are doing. Um, I really love this uh, uh, story that you shared with us, the, with Kelly, the advocate who is now, well, became an advocate, was originally a participant. Um, and the level of success there, I think, needs to be shared. Um, I, I think I've shared this with Consuelo, with you. I, I, there's um, different things that are needed to, uh, in this formula to address homelessness, right? One is the political will, obviously the funding, and then also the community will to accept and love and live next to our unhoused, our folks who are just uh, challenged uh, with staying in this area. And so I wonder how are we spreading that message in order to really augment the political will within our uh, community. Thank you for the question, Chair Arenas, and I'll let Consuelo add on anything, but I, I think this is an area that we're certainly focused on at the Office of Supportive Housing and working with our partners across other agencies, including uh, Destination Home. 
And really kind of thinking about, like you said, the various levels of communication. Um, and you know, this report kind of speaks to a certain audience, I would say kind of policymakers and folks who are already kind of familiar with our work. But I think you, I agree, and, and you know, we are seeing in a lot of our community engagement this kind of need for this larger, like you said, education and kind of um, familiarity with our system and our solutions and, um, you know, kind of the various, I think there's a lot of folks out there with kind of, you know, quick ideas, but, you know, how to really keep keep the eye on this system-wide and the need for a systemic approach across multiple agencies. So that's an area that we're really focused on. Consuelo, I don't know if you want to add. Thanks, Hillary, and thanks for the question. Uh, Chair Adenas, sorry, the awkwardness with the mic here. I want to <laughs> see you. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is really engaging with the Office of um, Public Affairs, um, and I'm sorry, they're, they changed their name, and so I, I know I got that wrong. Um, but helping them, sorry, having them help us in the storytelling. Um, so one of the things that we're mapping out right now through our communications um, discussions is how do we uh, connect them to the stories and then leverage their power of storytelling um, because that mm -hmm. is absolutely not, not something that we're particularly good at. You know, we have our heads down, focused on the work. So that's a really opportunity for us. And then for Affordable Housing Month um, in May, we will be hosting a session um, during the lunch hour where we'll talk about the system, um, share our progress and updates, um, and really leveraging the, the others who are good at telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a tremendous gap and an opportunity, uh, one that we are, um, anybody that's willing to, and open to help us, we will take it. Great. Well, listen, I think when we want to make systemic change, there's things that obviously you're already doing. You're, you're on that path. You're creating a huge system changes. But when we leave our public out of the conversation, we're not really creating this comprehensive systemic shift with everybody, right? The narrative is within all of those folks who already believe in what we're, what we're doing, right? And we understand it, and obviously you at a, at a very uh, micro level. Um, and so it, it reminds me, and I think I've said this before in this uh, committee, but it reminds me of that story of, of Texas and Don't Mess With Texas. And that was originally a campaign uh, to clean up Texas because there was a lot of litter in their freeways and highways and this was an effort from the transportation department of all places. It wasn't, you know, the the, uh, the visitors bureau or, um, you know, it wasn't to, to brand the, the, the state in any particular way. It was really to change the mindset and the ownership of residents and so, I think what's missing in this systems change framework is that particular piece that's going to carry us through the next phase of what we're doing, of really integrating folks in resource-rich communities like Palo Alto or North or West or North part of uh, um, North part of San Jose um, or West side of San Jose and all the resource-rich uh, uh, places where I know as a council member there's been a lot of pushback from communities and a lot of missed opportunities because people have these concerns and you know they clutch their children and say it's it's about our children and our safety and 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 so the narrative hasn't really changed um, and I think it, it nobody is a, a good storyteller <laughs> because that's not the work that we're meant to do. But I think we're, this is the piece that's missing. I think for system, for real systems change, this is the piece that we really need to elevate. And so I'd love to see how we could um, explore that piece um, more intentionally and, and have it really integrated in, in the way that we um, build out and, and carry out our, um, our plan to end homelessness. And I realize this is about supportive housing, but it's all with the purpose to end homelessness, of course. So that's my piece, and hopefully we can talk offline, Consuelo. All right. Um, I did ask you for members of the public. There's nobody 
who wants to speak to us. Um, so I'm going to ask my vice chair for a motion. Move uh, the recommended action, which is to receive the report, Madam Chair. Wonderful. And I'm, I'll second that, and let's call roll. Vice Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Chairperson Arenas. Aye. Motion passes. Awesome. So next we have item number five, and this is the United States Census Bureau methodology regarding urban and rural descriptors and Senate Bill 9. Um, we have the Department of Planning and Development. We're Thank you. Provide us an exciting presentation. It will be. Um, Jacqueline Anshano, Director of Planning and Development. We have today to present Robert Kane, one of our associate planners that has been working on with the U.S. Census Bureau, the Office of Planning and OPR, Office in Planning and Research, and HCD. Robert? Thank you, Jack. Thank you, uh, Chair Reynas, Vice Chair Simidian. My presentation to you today is about our department's efforts uh, to reach out to the federal and state agencies to discuss rural and urban designations, specifically as they relate to Senate Bill 9. Following direction from the board, the department reached out to the United States Census Bureau, the Governor's Office of uh, Planning and Research, or OPR, and the California Department of Housing and Community Development. When we met with the Census Bureau's uh, ge Geography Division, we specifically discussed how they reached their determinations of urban areas, and anything that is not designated as urban is therefore considered rural under their paradigm. We also talked to them about what changes were made to the 2020 Census criteria. Based on those changes and the new data that came in in 2020, some areas were reclassified that were previously urban as now no longer being urban or that were not becoming urban. But as you can see from this map, most areas that were urban after 2020 are still considered urban after 2020, including most of San Martin. We discussed how uh, this criteria might change again in the future, and they informed us that there can be no changes to the current criteria, and there is no appeals process currently. Um, allowed. However, we could propose changes for future census cycles. They did caution us that those changes would have to be uh, applied nationwide and might have unintended consequences because many federal agencies use the urban designations as part of their funding criteria. We also had a chance to meet with members of OPR in April. Um, they told us that they could not provide us with specific guidance on Senate Bill 9 implementation, but they were very interested in hearing what are uh, issues that we faced in our rural communities, and they indicated that they were willing to help incorporate that into future guidance in general plan guidelines that they produce. Uh, we also received an email response from the Housing and Community Development Department. Uh, they informed us that they could also not provide technical assistance on SB 9 beyond their public fact sheet. Uh, because SB 9 was adopted by the state legislature, that is really the area that we would have to go to if we wanted to see any change to the current criteria in Senate Bill 9. Excuse the interruption. Through the chair, Madam Chair. Yes, of course. I'm not feeling the love here. Is that what you're trying to tell us? <laughs> You're, you're, being, you're being so professional and so technical, but if, if the short version is, you know, they told us to pound sand, I, I want to encourage you to just say it out loud. Sure. Um, the, the direction that we got was basically there wasn't much that could be done from these particular agencies, uh, and really the focus should be on, this, on the state legislature if we want to see change. Thank you. I, I forgive the interruption. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something between the lines. Thank you. Sure, not, not at all. I, I think one of those bullets should be go pound sand, yeah. right? <laughs> no, it's just, it's. Yeah, it's missing. Maybe we can correct that. Some of the agencies were nicer in how they responded in that way than others were. Um, to that extent, uh, the board also expressed concern about how this urban designation was going to impact the South County um, and Coyote Valley specifically. 
Uh, we do have a number of policies in effect already in the county to protect those areas um, in terms of preserving farmland, uh, maintaining and preserving clean drinking water, and protecting the environment. Um, I would also like to note that Senate Bill 9 specifically does not apply to agriculture or ranch lands. So that is another protection that um, covers all of Coyote Valley. The unincorporated parts of Coyote Valley are not eligible for Senate Bill 9. Uh, but we do think that we should continue to strengthen both the protections we have here at the county and work with the state legislature to try to strengthen and maintain those protections that are currently in the state law. Uh, to that extent, the department is currently working with the county executive's um, intergovernmental relations unit, and we're working on a response to Senate Bill 450, which is by the same sponsor as Senate Bill 9, and seeks to further amend Senate Bill 9, even though it's only been in place for a couple of years now. Um, and so we're going to work together to try to get in some of the changes that would provide those um, better protections to our rural communities. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm available for any questions you might have. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, Madam Clerk, is there anyone in uh, chambers who would like to speak on this matter or online? We have no speakers in chambers and no virtual speakers. No virtual speakers, okay. Um, I'm gonna look to my colleague to see if there's any questions on his behalf. I have no comments or questions. If you'd like a motion to approve the recommended action, which is to simply receive the report, I'm happy to do that. And um, I, we, no direction is called for, but I appreciate the indication that staff will continue to work on these matters at the legislative level to the extent that that's promising. Thank you, Madam Chair. So move approval. Thank you. Um, so it, it sounds like we uh, we have very limited options here, but even though we have limited options, we, we already have um, policies that protect urban sprawl under LAFCO. Um, our county already uses uh, um, policies, like I said, that, that can help um, those urban rural um, parcels. And so one of, the, one of the things I think that that we could ask in the future is to have SB9 require um, uh, any of those uh, lands uh, to connect to uh, services. That could be an option. Is that something that, that we could pursue um, so that it would help alleviate maybe some of those concerns in those rural areas of our county that don't have direct services from the cities? Uh, through the chair, yes, absolutely. Um, one of our main concerns for these rural parcels or areas that we consider rural um, is their lack of water and, and sewer connections. Right. Um, so that is something that we're discussing, proposing. Um, we, we've drafted a memo to county executive um, and we're gonna be having discussions, but our department fully supports uh, trying to put in some kind of language into Senate Bill 9 or, or the amendments to Senate Bill 9 that would require an applicant to show that they can connect to those types of utilities and services. Great, so it sounds like you're working on that. Would it help for us to um, modify the motion and um, cross-reference it to advance it to the full board for discussion? Good morning. Um, yes. Chairperson Arenas. Okay. Uh, yes, <laughs> it would be. Um, we do have annually these legislative policies that we adopt and that gives staff the ability, the authorization to um, work with our uh, state lobbyists and our intergovernmental affairs unit in our department to advocate. I don't know what coverage we have with respect to the existing document, but it would be helpful um, if we don't have that coverage um, to bring this to the board, which we can do in order to expressly seek that authorization. And I wanna underscore 
the point of the department is that we have long standing these these growth policies go back 50 years that right. have been um, this is why we're not Los Angeles and protecting green belts, right. preserving prime ag land and and protecting natural resources. And we really strongly support having SB 9 aligned with those longstanding right. growth policies. Right. So we support any kind of um, right. support we can get from the board with respect to that. Of course. No, and it all makes sense. So how about if we include that in, in the motion, um, Vice Chair? And I mean, it doesn't hurt if we already have it, then great. If we don't, then if we need it. I think it's helpful there. clarification. I'm happy to incorporate it in the motion. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, and I did already second that, so we can call roll. Vice Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Chairperson Arenas. Aye. Motion passes. Perfect. All right, so we are gonna, and thank you so much, Robert. I know that you uh, took it on the chin. Um, knowing it was going to be really difficult to get those answers, and so I appreciate that. All right, so next we have item six. Uh, this is an update on Lehigh cement plant closure, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Department of Planning and Development. Jacqueline, <clears throat> excuse me, Jacqueline Unshano, Director of Planning and Development. I'll just give a little background and set the stage. We received a referral on March 16th from the Board of Supervisors 2023 to report back in April, May, and June on securing a legally binding and permanent agreement um, for closure of the Lehigh cement plant. And so um, we have with us this morning Rob Salisbury, senior principal planner, Rob Salisbury, who manages our quarries. Rob? It's not on. Thank you for that, Director Anshano. Uh, bear with me just for one second, if you would. I just got uh, booted from the Zoom meeting, so I'm gonna try to rejoin here so I can share my presentation. While we wait for that um, presentation to go up, I just want to remind folks that um, we only have one remaining item, which is item seven. It's roadmap to 2030 carbon neutrality for county operations. And so if you plan to speak, please raise your hand at the appropriate time. It'll be a wonderful. May wonderful. I interject a moment? We have, um, in addition to the carbon neutrality presentation, the overview of uh, the budget proposals. Oh, the of course, right. yes, budget. I just wanted to calibrate Wait, everyone's that expectations. That one thing that everybody's been working on for the last many weeks. Yes, of course, there is one. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for catching um, for catching that one. Okay, I apologize for the delay, but I believe I am ready to commence my presentation. Perfect, go right ahead. Thank you, Chairperson Arenas, Supervisor Smidian, and members of the Hewlett Committee. Item before you is an update on the Lehigh Cement Plant Closure Agreement. My name is Robert Salisbury. I'm a principal planner with the County of Santa Clara Department of Planning and Development. First, a little bit of background. The Lehigh Cement Plant is located in unincorporated county west of the city of Cupertino. And you can there's a, a map up on the screen that shows the areas of the quarry, including the main quarry pit and the cement plant. So just a little bit of background on the operation of the facility for context. Lehigh Permanente started mining limestone in Cupertino in approximately 1903. The quarry is vested and does not need or have a use permit for their quarrying use. They have a separately permitted cement plant, which was authorized by a use permit approved by the County Board of Supervisors in 1937. 
And this use permit allows Lehigh to produce and store cement at their Cupertino facility. So on November 17th, 2022, before this, com before this committee, uh, Lehigh staff made a presentation and made some statements about their plans for the future of the Lehigh facility. And, and just to provide a little bit of info about the cement uh, production, it's a two-step process. Clinker is produced by sintering limestone in the clinker kiln, and then it's ground into a finished cement uh, via a cement mill. So during the November 17, 2022 Hewlett meeting, Lehigh staff stated that they permanently ceased clinker production at their Lehigh facility. With that in mind, the department received a referral from the Board of Supervisors on April 18th, directing County Council, with the assistance of the Department of Planning and Development, to reach an agreement on permanent closure of the cement plant kiln. Separately, the Board directed the Department, uh, or directed the Planning Commission, to schedule revocation, modification, or reaffirmation hearing on the cement plant use permit. The board also requested status updates on progress towards reaching an agreement with Lehigh in April, May, and June of this year. So the current status is that uh, planning staff and county council staff have met multiple times with Lehigh executives. Lehigh executives have indicated a willingness to enter into an agreement, acknowledging permanent closure of the cement plant kiln. County Council is currently drafting that agreement. And planning staff is preparing for revocation, reaffirmation, and modification hearing before the Planning Commission if that should become necessary. And as I said, uh, subsequent status reports can be provided to this committee in May and June of this year as directed. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to ask for public comment if there's any in the chambers or online. We have one speaker in chambers and no virtual speakers. Thank you. Our first speaker is Rhoda Fry. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, in 2019, by the way, there was a massive industrial accident at uh, Lehigh, and um, the cement plant sputtered through 2019 and the beginning of 2020. We had lots of pollution, and unfortunately, BACMED was no mer nowhere to be found. I do have a handout for you that includes a letter from MidPen. Um, with respect to plant closure, that's fine and dandy. Um, it's been expected. Uh, modern pollution rules would preclude making a new kiln infeasible. Um, we do need to look at the present, and I'm begging you to stop putting profits of this giant foreign company ahead of public health. This is a matter of urgency. We need to reclaim the quarry. It's overdue. Quarry dust flies multiple miles, and its particulate matter has devastating impact on human health. But there's more. The county has looked the other way. While Lehigh has exported rock that is needed for reclamation. Midpen was vehemently against building a new rock plant and exporting rock. The previous um, rock plant had been dismantled. If they had a vested right, they lost it. And besides, the rock that is being exported is needed on site per the approved 2012 plan. Every truck driving out of there now means another one driving in in the years to come, creating health impacts and further delaying reclamation. Read Menped's letter. Lehigh was allowed to continue mining based on the 2012 approved plan that, is, that used on-site rock. Please sit, stop sitting on your hands and waiting for a new plan. Supervisor Simidian, I ask that you direct staff to investigate whether the new rock plant and exports are allowed. I have a dossier that I can share and have previously shared with staff. Let's please put people ahead of profits we're your constituents, not Lehigh. Thank you. And to the chair, that concludes speakers, but I do have a Levine Act announcement for this item. 
Item number six is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents and any participant who has a financial interest or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, I'm gonna to look to my colleague for comment. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I should just indicate um, we had uh, our eighth annual Lehigh Town Hall last night in Cupertino. Uh, first time we tried doing it both in person and uh, virtually. Seemed to work well. We had about 150 participants, 50 in the room and 100 online. Want to thank the many members of uh, the county organization who participated, including Mr. Salisbury. So we're getting a lot of quality time together uh, here, sir. And uh, uh, Ms. Anshana was kind enough to join us. Ms. McKyle was there from uh, planning as well, folks from County Council, Environmental Health. Uh, really very much appreciated. To, um, to sort of return to the matter before us uh, specifically, um, Madam Chair, I'm going to uh, share a couple of thoughts only because we were a little bit rushed at the full board meeting and I uh, wanted to take advantage of the time we had, little time we had to move the item off the agenda successfully, but we didn't really get much of a chance to talk about it. Just so staff understands uh, the thinking behind the referral that uh, I brought. <coughs> um, and this was, we were reminded of this last night, I think. It's 3,500 acres. It's more than a dozen different governmental entities. It's more than a century's worth of activity. You don't wrap all that up in a tidy bow, lickety split, as much as my sense of urgency might compel me to exhort you to uh, that end. So for me, this is about keeping our eye on the prize. And the shutdown of the kiln uh, I, have, I have three goals, which I've articulated uh, previously, Madam Chair. Shut down the plant, shut down the quarry, start the restoration and reclamation process. That's, um, that may be the most concise summary of anything I can ever deliver in this committee. Shut down the plant, shut down the quarry, start the reclamation and restoration process. Uh, the thing that is right there in front of us, right there in front of us, if we could only grab it, is the closure of that kiln. Um, Lehigh has said publicly that they do not have plans to restart the kiln. It was helpful, I thought, last night for the, I believe it was the Bay Area Regional Air Quality Board representatives who indicated that their permit there has expired and that if they came back with a request for a new permit, that would require um, 21st century technology at a great cost, which is not anticipated. So. Uh, and as your staff report indicates, there seems to be some receptiveness uh, to the idea um, on the part of the folks at Lehigh who call themselves Heidelberg Materials these days. Uh, that was certainly the impression I got when I visited myself uh, earlier uh, this month uh, in Dallas, Irving, Texas. And I think the obvious question is sort of how do we get that, how do we close the deal for lack of a better phrase, on uh, that plant closure in a way that is permanent and legally binding, gets it out of the use permit. And I think um, we have certainly gotten uh, Heidelberg's attention by referring the uh, 2,135 violations to our planning commission for consideration of a use permit revocation or amendment. Um, my own view is that would be challenging for them and us, just given the scope and complexity that I've described earlier, with an uncertain result at a date <coughs> far in the future. And so what I'm suggesting and have suggested and what the referral suggests is that if we can get a commitment uh, th that the use permit will ultimately uh, not uh, include a, um, a cement plant operation, a kiln operation, that these other matters, and they are many and they are important, um, could be discussed at the staff level by our staff. So I'm looking at Ms. Anshano and I'm looking at County Council's office uh, and the folks at Lehigh and try and uh, see if we can reach essentially a negotiated settlement with them. Now, 
I, I think it's important that this stuff happen in an open, public, and transparent way. So eventually, that work product would have to come in the form of a recommendation to our planning commission and possibly to our full board of supervisors. But I just think that's likely to be a quicker and more productive exercise than um, trying to thrash out the consequences of every one of those 2,135 violations. But the referral explicitly makes that alternative approach conditioned on getting a timely response on this proposal for uh, a lasting, binding, permanent closure on the kiln. So Madam Chair, that's what you would have been stuck listening to if, uh, if, I'd, if we'd had the time at the last board meeting, which we didn't, uh, and I'm glad we had the opportunity to say it here. And um, you know, as somebody put it to me, they say they don't have any plans to start up, so it shouldn't be that hard. Um, it's always harder than we think it will be, and there's some kind of, but you know, we've got this, got this time, and uh, I thought a little sense of urgency again about saying, let's see if we can wrap this up in the next couple of months and see what happens. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, and uh, I'm also a little determined on this one. So thank you. And, and can you repeat your, your three? Shut down the quarry, shut down the... You're going to be the favorite committee vice chair all day <laughs> if you ask. You give me that opportunity again. <laughs> shut down the cement plant, shut down the quarry, begin the restoration and reclamation of the site. I say you put that on a t-shirt and on the back, shut down the kiln. There you go. Right? All right. Okay, so we are, you made a motion? Move, move approval, uh, received a report, and uh, with the, uh, I gather we are gonna hear back on progress at this committee in uh, May and June, is that the plan? And I, if that's agreeable to you, Madam Chair, I think that's helpful and important. Sure thing, and Thank I'll you. second that. And we'll take, uh, we'll call roll. Vice Chairperson Samidian? Aye. Chairperson Arenas? Yes. Motion passes. Wonderful. So now we're going to move to item number seven. This is the roadmap to 2030 carbon neutrality for um, our county operations. And so we're going to take a look at this presentation. Who's coming to the? Chairperson Arenas, as, uh, as the staff. <laughs> is setting up. Um, I wanted just to make a couple of introductory comments. Um, this proposal, as you'll hear, will accelerate our plans to reach carbon neutrality from 2045 to 2030. That aligns us with the state, and, um, and, and I say that importantly. You know, we have 482 cities in California and 58 counties, and we all have to work towards this end because we, in fact, can affect change at state scale. And, uh, and I say that because many times, I think even as an individual citizen, but as an entity here in an organization in California, it feels as if cli the climate crisis is bigger than all of us. And I really want to underscore the point that as we put our collective efforts together, we can achieve this. And this is an existential crisis that we are bestowing upon our children. And so it is absolutely important that we focus our attention. And what is unlike what I've seen in other organizations is that this isn't a notional plan. In fact, we call it a roadmap because um, we have very specific targeted strategic investments that will yield really um, extraordinary gains with respect to reducing our carbon. And I really wanted to um, underscore that point because um, I see the path forward, they see the path forward, and we hope we get you excited to see that we can do this and continue to um, serve in a leadership role in this arena. So with that, we'll turn it over to the staff. But before we do, if I may, through the chair, <clears throat> um, I'm going to inflict upon you all a story. <laughs> and the story takes, take uh, this, and the story takes place uh, during my tenure in the California State Senate and the governorship of Arnold Schwarzenegger and the extraordinary work that one of my colleagues was doing in 2006, Fran Pavley, to create California's Global Warming Solutions Act, on which I was privileged to be her co-author. And uh, she was struggling, Senator Pavley was struggling to get the administration to um, sort of embrace the more robust path forward uh, that uh, she and I thought was necessary in terms of global warming issues, climate change issues. And so the governor asked us uh, to, to have, uh, to his office to have a meeting. 
So Senator Pavley and I show up, and uh, for those of you who were either around at the time or have some history, uh, such meetings often took place, and they did in this case, in the governor's uh, cigar tent, which was out in the uh, patio area, uh, surrounded by the four walls of the Capitol building. And, <clears throat> um, and, and there was, I thought, some irony, which the, apparently the governor did not see, about talking about air quality while the governor was puffing on the cigar in the contained cigar tent, which was uh, his way of complying with no smoking in the Capitol uh, requirements. So we're in a tent full of cigar smoke, and uh, talking about the bill, and uh, I'm trying to, because uh, I chair the committee through which the bill was going, trying to make the bill stronger, and the governor's you know, ambivalent, and the author doesn't want to lose her bill. So these are the kind of negotiations, conversations that you know, government officials have everywhere. And the governor asked, I thought, actually a pretty good question, and this is what prompted the story from back in the day, which is, you know, we're just one state in a pretty big world, how can we be expected to carry this load? And you know what I said to the governor in the moment um, is, well, governor, that's true, but we are the fifth largest economy in the world, and that means that there are 195 nations behind us who are asking themselves, why should we step up to this challenge if the fifth largest economy in the world, California, does not? So, you know, easy enough, as uh, uh, Sylvia Arena said, uh, Sylvia Arena, excuse me, Sylvia Gallego said uh, a moment ago to sort of think, well, that's somebody else's or that's bigger than us. But, you know, the fact of the matter is we got an awful lot of other folks who are going to follow only if there is someone doing something, someone they can follow. And if we aren't that someone, I don't know who that someone's going to be. So uh, whenever these conversations come up, and I'm glad we're having it again today to make some of this stuff really real, um, I always think back to that moment in the smoke-filled cigar tent with uh, the governor uh, asking why we should step up, and the answer is because somebody's got to lead, and if not us, who? So with that, I'll say thank you for your forbearance with the, the story, but it just made me smile as I heard the introduction. Good morning, Supervisor Rainer, Supervisor Smirian. I wish I had as colorful a story to tell about how we came up with the roadmap, so maybe someday <laughs> we can match that story of yours. Again, morning, everyone. Jusneet Sharma, the Director for the Office of Sustainability. Um, I think between Sylvia and Supervisor Smirian, that was a wonderful opening, so I'm not going to go into a lot of my comments that I had as well, which speak to a lot of why now, why it's so important for us to step up, and why do we need to take action now and in the moment. Um, just a reminder that the county had established a commitment to carbon neutrality by 2045 for county operations. And as, as both of you spoke, the, in response to the really the accelerating climate risks that we are seeing, and both to align with state, but in some case actually lead for the state as well, not just align, uh, we are really putting forward this roadmap to 2030 for county operations for the committee's consideration today. Um, and there's one more uh, point I do want to make, uh, that while this plan is specific to county operations, there is uh, an alternative effort or another effort that's going on, which is to develop a roadmap for our unincorporated parts of the county. But within that, there's also an element where we are doing a countywide baseline study, and we'll be working with all the cities to establish inventory for the full county and also come up with regional strategies. So our hope is with that is to move all the cities along with us and move forward with them uh, together. Uh, I'll make quick introductions and then hand it off. Um, we have uh, Gillian Corral, she is the sustainability manager with the Office of Sustainability. And then from facilities and fleet today, we have David Berry, he's the chief of facilities planning. And then Susanna Santiago, she's the sustainability and climate change uh, program manager. Both Gillian and Susanna will be leading the presentation, so I'll hand it off to them. Good morning and pleasure to meet you both. I'm Gilly Corral, as Jesse mentioned. I, I think actually Sylvia took a little bit of my thunder, but we are experiencing an existential crisis. The scientific evidence today is unequivocal that climate change is a threat, as she mentioned, to human health and our planet's well-being. Um, our climate is headed for irreversible and catastrophic conditions if we don't act immediately. 
to curb climate pollution. What you see on your screen is local data. Our county is projected to see an increase in extreme heat days and warm nights, extreme wet and dry events, and more frequent and intense storms, as well as an increase to the frequency, the duration, and the extent of wildfires. Uh, with a one to two foot increase in sea level rise, we'll also see additional coastal flooding. Climate change is a stress multiplier. Uh, we say that uh, when we're thinking about the climate crisis amplifying existing inequities. So that would be with housing affordability and food insecurity, as well as income disparity and education and health outcomes. And we saw this during the pandemic, that certain populations are at higher risk for being harmed based on socioeconomic characteristics and as well as the built conditions in which they live. We know that the cr climate crisis is already here. The impacts of climate change, we are already feeling them throughout Santa Clara County. And these data on the screen reflect, again, local impacts from the 2020 SEU Lightning Complex fire, which resulted in widespread damage. The county incurred significant costs for repairs to roads, parks, bridges, and recreational facilities, as well as debris removal. The August to September heat wave was one of the hottest and longest in California for September ever. Peak summer heat for California is normally in July and August. But we know that longer and more frequent, as well as more severe extreme events for heat are expected to occur in our county. In 2022, we experienced 21 days above 90 degrees in the county, which was surpassing the number of projected heat days. California experienced 31 atmospheric rivers this winter season. These storm events from late December through March brought record amounts of rainfall and high winds and flooding, which resulted in road closures, power outages, and evacuations. These events are very much in line with the climate projections that I've shared earlier, which alert us to an increase in extreme wet and dry periods. So we saw a drought, uh, severe drought conditions, which followed, were followed by a storm event of a much bigger magnitude than we'd seen before. Uh, which is, again, going back to the warming ocean waters and atmosphere holding more moisture. And with that, I'll hand it off to Susanna for the county emissions profile. Good morning, everyone. Susanna Santiago, Facilities and Fleet Department. I'll briefly go over the operation-specific emissions inventory. We are using calendar year 2019 as our primary source of emissions for our carbon neutrality efforts but have included the 2020 inventory to demonstrate potential emissions reductions that resulted out of the shelter in place order due to COVID-19. In 2019, employee commute emissions accounted for 61% of total emissions, followed by buildings and facilities at 26%, fleet at six, solid waste at five, and reimbursed employee miles at 1%. In 2020, the employee commute sector dropped to 47% of total emissions for county operations, and overall are estimated to be 24% less than 2019 as a result of the continued implementation of the county's sustainability master plan, and 33.7% of county employees working from home five days a week during the duration of the shelter-in-place order. The county is well positioned to take action to minimize the impact of its own operations on the climate. This will enable us to tackle the climate crisis, align ourselves with the state of California and other jurisdictions that are already accelerating efforts and also maintain the county's leadership in this area. With targeted investments, the county can achieve the goals and objectives shown on these slides for the different emission sectors. The attached roadmap report provides the full menu of actions. However, in this presentation, we will only review the key actions for each sector in the subsequent slides. To be noted, the goals for each sector align with the goals adopted within the sustainability master plan. Starting with the building sector. Since county facilities currently operate at 100% renewable electricity, natural gas usage is the primary source of emissions for this sector. The two key objectives for this sector, which are to reduce natural gas use by 50% in the county's building portfolio and strengthen the all-electric new construction code adopted by the county in 2021, 
were informed from the facility's electrification study that was recently completed and is attached in this report. There are 12 county facilities which are the top natural gas users and represent almost 90% of the total county building's gas use. Valley Medical Center accounts for 30% of total natural gas usage for just the steam absorption chillers alone, followed by our fuel cell systems at 17.6%. Investing in these two can reduce natural gas utilization by nearly 50% to meet the 2030 objective. Reducing emissions associated with employee commute by 85% will require implementing innovative transportation demand management programs and installing EV charging stations. This can be achieved by providing transit subsidies, installing EV charging stations, and encouraging teleworking for eligible employees. The existing telework policy aligns with organizational practices currently in place and employees' ability to do remote work. Transit subsidies would lead to 10% emissions reduction. It could be more with as public transit transitions to cleaner fuels. Based on current charging station utilization and employee commute survey data, it is estimated that 10% of employees will drive EVs by 2024, but by 2030, with 1,000 total ports available, it's assumed that at least 50% of employees will drive plug-in hybrids or EVs and emissions would be reduced by 50% or more. If we take these three actions, we'll achieve overall 74% emissions reductions from this sector. This slideshow shows the goals and objectives for the fleet sector. The objective is to achieve a total of 1,000 chargers and replace 75% of the light duty fleet to be zero emission have been, have been developed to also align with advanced clean fleet rules and requirements being proposed by the California Air Resources Board, which if adopted will require 50% of new addition to fleets to be zero emission vehicles between 2024 and 2026, and then all new additions after 2027 to be zero emission. Currently, 31% of county fleet run on alternative fuels. The total number of light duty vehicles that are forecasted to meet target replacement criteria from now until 2030 are 1,229, which is higher than the 75% target. Over the next two years, the county will install 26 EV charging ports at six site locations and will continue to develop an EV charging infrastructure and light, light vehicle duty replacement plan. We'll also complete the diesel free by 33 study that will provide a plan for how the county can switch all equipment and medium and heavy duty vehicles to a diesel free source by 2033. Solid waste is our final sector for county operations. The 2030 objectives, as well as Senate Bill 1383 requirements related to organic waste recycling and surplus food recovery have been included as part of the new waste services for county facilities request for proposals and will be a significant criteria for vendor selection. This July, we will have a new contract that will result in enhanced organic collection, food recovery, and recycling in all county facilities, including our hospitals. Although the county has laid out an ambitious plan to shrink emissions in each of these sectors, we do recognize that due to various factors, we won't be able to reduce all emissions. To offset remaining emissions, the county will need to rely on carbon offsets and carbon sequestration. So carbon sequestration pulls carbon out of the air and stores it in the ground and in plants. And these practices also provide other benefits such as flood protection and water conservation, as well as improvements to air and water quality. And the county has over 52,000 acres of parkland, which could provide opportunities for carbon sequestration and can also set the county up um, in a position of leadership nationally because carbon sequestration is still a relatively new field in climate action planning. This slide summarizes the key actions across the five sectors that Susanna presented and the overall percentage of emissions reduction from each of these actions. These phase one actions here on the screen are critical to start the county down this carbon neutrality pathway. 
Many of these projects that Suzanne has mentioned are already underway, such as the Valley Medical Center Chiller Electrification Plant, the Diesel, th uh, diesel free, free by 33 study, and fleet of electrification and electric vehicle ins installation um, for charging infrastructure. Other projects will require county general funds moving forward. We're also exploring external funding sources, such as public utility programs in the Air District to invest in electric vehicle charging infrastructure and fleet electrification. We're looking to state and federal sources, such as the Inflation Reduction Act and the nearly $48 million allocated by the governor in 2021 and 2022 to advance the state's climate agenda. And we're, we're still trying to understand the level and the timing of the funding from state and federal sources, um, and also what the implications will be for one-time and ongoing general funds. And with that, we conclude our presentation and have the recommended actions before the committee today. Thank you so much for your time, and we're here to answer any questions. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful presentation. I'm gonna ask uh, our clerk if there's anybody who is in chambers or online. We do have one uh, speaker in chambers, Kirk Oatman. Hello. Hi, welcome. <clears throat> I'm Kirk Oatman. I'm a co-founder of a company called I'm in Control. Yes, that's the name of the company. Uh, we provide building control systems. So first of all, we support and applaud the thoroughness and precision of the roadmap and the objectives of the county. So this is totally in support of what they have presented. But first, a useful reference point. <laughs> in the US, there are 5.3 million commercial buildings 300,000 of them are large, over 100,000 square feet. And most energy and sustainability efforts are directed at those large buildings, somewhat by necessity by program structure and so forth. The remaining 5 million buildings have much less attention in these efforts. We've identified that about 2 million of them are useful targets for energy reduction. We don't know these numbers for facilities operated by the county, but we expect that at least half of the buildings that you own or operate are applicable to this discussion. So, as examples, we've monitored electric usage and controlled heating and air conditioning at two county sites for a number of years. Um, Holden Ranch with Sheriff's Training and Probation Offices and the 20,000 square foot uh, building at 2101 Alexian which uh, provides social services and a methadone clinic. At both of them, we achieved over 20% reduction in electric consumption, and though unmeasured, uh, probably about the same for gas. Simple financial payback for a system like ours, not just ours, is typically two years or less, and federal and state funds are mentioned uh, in the roadmap uh, as available for some of these programs. So. Our suggestion is this, that the county consider studying and funding reduction of gas and electric consumption at your buildings, which are less than 50,000 square feet, under the buildings and facilities uh, category there. And uh, this work would necessarily be cross-departmental. And I'll stop because I ran out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I look to my colleague for any comments. I guess I would only ask, uh, Madam Chair, if there are observations about the uh, <clears throat> recommendations from the speaker and particularly around the issue of sort of at what level do we think it makes sense to engage in terms of size of structures and impact potential. Is that a question for the speaker? That's a question for the staff. For the staff. I see them all trying to figure out who gets stuck answering that question is what I'm. <clears throat> sure, absolutely. Um, 
As he mentioned, we typically do um, tend to lean towards our larger buildings because they're our largest um, energy uh, consumers. As a, but also, we do pay closer attention to our, um, our smaller, less than 50,000 50, square feet, as he mentioned. Um, we do complete energy studies and retro commissioning, which we call um, building tune-ups that we do for our facilities. But we um, could also do further analysis as requested, if needed. Well, my... And if I can add to that, we are, uh, FAF is well, trying to establish a utility database management system as well. So that is really going to help us get a better understanding of like site-specific information. And then I think we can be more nimble on as we see ups and downs, like water conservation is a classic example. We saw the drought and we really needed to figure out where we need to reduce our usage. So I think that is something they are working on right now and it'll come up soon. Um, Supervisor Arenas, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how many of the folks at the dais here will recall, but uh, I know Ms. Gagos will recall when I first returned to the board back in 2013, I made some proposals for energy conservation strategies, uh, and candidly, they took forever, uh, back to the issue of urgency. Um, and, you know, I don't say that critically, although I might and could in another setting, but I just say it matter-of-factly, it, it just didn't move very quickly. Uh, I mean, like, years and years, not quickly. And um, even on stuff that people said they wanted to do. So where I am on this one, I think, is uh, I'm prepared to move the staff recommendation, but with further direction, if uh, it's uh, agreeable to you, to, um, uh, to consider uh, smaller structures uh, on a timeline that they could share with us uh, in an off-agenda report, if that makes sense to both you and to staff, Madam Chair. Uh, so the idea is to begin with with the smaller buildings that we have. No, the, I think the idea, if I'm looking at staff, is to begin with the larger buildings. Yes, yeah, but you're you're asking for them to begin with the smaller. No, I, I'm asking them to go ahead with their plan, stay uh -huh. with the larger ones, but to then say, okay, the the b smaller buildings that we didn't get to yet oh, will sudden will 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 get cycled in at some point on a for consideration on a timeline to be determined. And to make that real, ask them to send us an off agenda okay. report that tells us, hey, here's the other 247 buildings that we might include, whatever the number is, uh, and here's what their size is, whatever the number is, and here's the timeline that we think uh, we might look at these on, whatever that timeline looks like. It just ensures that that work begins uh, with some encouragement from the the staff, and I see Ms. Gallegos is leaning in as well. Thank you. So we do understand the request and are happy to prepare that. Um, as you know, and, and this is a good segue to the budget discussion, it's all about the relative priority with all the different other competing requests. So what we can show you, and it is the right path, which is to start with, you know, what is the existing utilization um, and having that baseline data because then we can be, and, I'm, and we're really focused on that, try to make the investments that yield the best improvements. And so we, we need to go through that yet, but we will show you a timeline and we will also show you that if you made, you know, X additional investment, we can accelerate this work so that the board has options. Through the chair, if I may, it almost reminds me of the conversation we had 15 minutes ago about, you know, let's start with the big important thing called the kiln, and then we can get to this other stuff because we know it's important, but we also know we should make sure we tackle the biggest, most important, and most obvious uh, challenge right in front of us. And so I think that makes sense. Motion, uh, as I say. Uh, to uh, approve with that additional direction from committee. Uh, I'll second that. Um, are, are those your questions, Vice Chair? Yes, thank you. That's okay. all I have. Um, one of the ways that, w one of the first um, votes that I, um, I had the honor to support as a council member when I first started was the um, establishment of our clean energy department. Um, 
And it was just absolutely amazing to, to be able to do that. And that was one of the ways that um, the city recognized that we could reduce our um, uh, greenhouse gases ourselves. Um, and so it, it, th this is a different, obviously this is, we're, we're different um, systems. And so I, w one of the questions I have is, I know we're going, you're going to focus on the, um, on the buildings and reducing natural gas in, in the buildings. Um, and in the meantime, while we get to that point where we're, we're actually having that reduction, because I know it's going to take a lot of money, right? It's just going to take a lot of investment to do that. It's the right thing to do. Um, what, is our, um, what is our source of energy? Are we, are we using uh, relatively clean energy in the meantime? What, what are our alternatives here? I'm very proud to say on behalf of the county or organization that um, we have strived to be 100% renewable energy. And we are part of the uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy Authority that uses, aggregates purchasing power in order to accelerate that above what PG&E was uh, trying to accomplish in their shift to clean energy. One. Through the chair, if I may, you may want to uh, look at police and facilities and say, tell us again about how much uh, we have in the way of solar, uh, just to give them a, a chance to brag on their work and as well as to answer your question, Madam Chair. Who wants the Easter egg? I'm not sure. Do you have the number off the top of your head? No. <laughs> I know we've included in the report, so maybe we can quickly find it for you. Sure. My recollection through the chair, it just I apologize, but of just course. to help them answer the question mm -hmm. is that we were one of the 10 mm -hmm. largest uh, uh, institutions in the country uh, in terms of our, I'll call it homegrown, wholly owned uh, solar uh, sourcing uh, that is actually on county property or, or that are county facilities. Am I remembering that roughly right? Uh, we actually rank number eight on the EPA. Mm, okay. Now, see, when it comes to bragging, they know the number. That's good. The number I do know. I, like I don't know the size of the systems off Got the top it. of thank my head. You. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Sorry for the interruption. No, thank you. Thank you. And um, and I'm now I'm actually absolutely proud uh, to be part of um, uh, the effort that you've already established. Um, and I wonder where the airports um, fit into place. Um, I know they're not our fleet, so they're not part of that, but I know that the board just made a huge effort in um, transitioning from unleaded to, I mean, from leaded yes. to unleaded fuel. Um, and I didn't see that factor in, in terms of what that reduction. Uh, let me respond to that, and then um, I may ask Mr. Freitas to join us. But I will say, at both airports, we have uh, large solar arrays that are non-aviation uses that we're trying to work through the FAA to um, have them approve. And you're absolutely right. January 1st, 2022, um, the way I describe it is we're the first airport system in the country that, due to the leadership of the board, based on a study that was conducted by uh, Dr. Zaran, that showed conclusively that the operations were contributing to blood lead in children in a, in the, um, a mile and a half um, radius. And I wanted to, and I say this with pride, um, also announce that that study was then submitted to the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which is the most prestigious science journal, and was published, um, and also submitted to the EPA, so when it's undertaking its endangerment finding um, of airborne lead, and we're waiting um, eagerly for the results, and I expect a conclusion that, in fact, the airborne lead from leaded avgas does contribute um, detrimentally to health and welfare that um, that study was part of that integrated science assessment um, where I believe they'll make that conclusion soon. Um, we do have analysis with respect to um, fuel consumption, but um, um, you're right, we, we reduced leaded emissions. I don't know if it's, um, if we have any specific, and I'm gonna turn to 
Ms. Sharma, if we have specific data that we can share with respect to that. I think the distinction to make here is between what we call scope one, two, and three emissions. So as part of operations, what we really focus on is scope one and two, directly like the emissions that come out from our own operations. And for something like the airport, because it's beyond just operations, you have a lot of other traffic coming in and going. That is part of scope three. And if you look at the, the, the accounting protocol that's used right now for operations, the focus is usually on one and two, uh, and not as much on three. Uh, but it's something that communities are and, and jurisdictions are looking at in the future. We're just not there yet. Mm. Well, I'm just saying we, we, we've made some policies that are going to improve mm -hmm. um, the, the local environment for our families, we should be able to factor that in, take credit for it, and see what that translates into. I don't know how that would be, but I, I hope that we could. We can look into it, certainly, yeah. for future inventories as well, and yes. Yeah, I just thought it was a, a huge step uh, in the right direction. I mean, the, the biggest step in the right direction is closing that airport, mm -hmm. of course. Um, but in the interim, this is one way of mitigating that impact to our community. So I'd love to see what that translates to. All right, um, those are my questions. Those are my, my comments. I, I, I love the, the energy and um, the goals, the huge goals that you're set um, and established here uh, on the roadmap. And um, I know that you're already in the works of pursuing, you know, regional, state, federal grants and, and funding um, so that we don't impact our general fund as much. And so I'd uh, love to hear what those updates are. Every once in a while, come back to us and let us know and how we can be supportive as, uh, of, as well. I had office hours in um, Gilroy on Monday. I'm, I'm losing count. But one day this week I did that. And... You know, one of the, one of the, um, it, it was just this micro, uh, it, they're not even a 501c3, but they're on their way to, to become one, and they serve the community really well, this, this group um, does. And the, the major item um, in terms of agenda for the youth group that they had um, organized was environment. And, you know, these are, our, our next generation is so invested and we need to figure out how to utilize um, their commitment to our planet mm -hmm. um, and really have them contribute in a meaningful way. And so it would be wonderful to figure out how our youth and our community are, mm -hmm. are feeding into the efforts that you're working on on a daily basis. And I'd love to get the name of the organization, uh, also from the perspective that we are launching the Youth Climate Initiative, oh, and are actually next week holding a meeting with a number of our partners and stakeholders. So I'd actually really like that name to make sure they're invited to that meeting next week as well. Oh, great. Yeah, great, and great, We can great. keep you posted on that. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for all the really great work. All right, so late, let's uh, call roll. We already have a motion in a second. Vice Chairperson Semidian. Aye. Chairperson Arenas. Yes. Motion passes. Congratulations. And off to the race as you go. Oh. I'm happy to kick off the budget discussion. And I should indicate I have to leave in five or ten minutes, so, and I am um, apologize, but i got to get to a library JPA meeting. If there is a motion required, I um, want to make sure I put that motion out and we get action on it, even if there's some follow-up conversation, Madam Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> to respond to that, it's a receive report. Um, we are, let me just set the table, then invite the departments to speak. And, and um, you know, Supervisor Simidian, um, as you noted, you've been here in your second time around since 2013, so you're um, acquainted with these departments. And really, uh, what we did is orient the presentation for Chairperson Arenas, who's new and is obviously. Um, continuing to learn, you know, it's only, what, April, um, the entire county organization. So really the presentation was oriented around that. I'm going to take the implied compliment, but um, <laughs> a, 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 a acknowledge anyone who thinks they fully understand the county budget even after a decade is uh, perhaps being unduly self-congratulatory. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so 
What I'm happy to do, Madam Chair, to facilitate the meeting, given the challenge, is move approval of the recommended action, which is to receive the report. Uh, and if we can get action on that, then the business of the committee will be conducted. I'll sit for a few minutes and learn some more, but then I'll quietly slip away while the con meeting continues, if that works. I, I appreciate that. I'll second that, and, uh, and I'll stay back and learn. Next. And then I can come to you and say, what's yes, this about again? Of so, course. Consistent by, with the By Brown June, Act. I should have this all Good. just under control. You. You, you ask me anything. Right. Let right. me talk a little bit about process, unless the clerk needs to... Well, if we, we do have a motion and a second if I can do the roll call vote so that uh, supervisor Thank you. And quickly, any public comment? On this we item? have no public comment okay. on this item, either virtually or in chambers. Uh, Vice Chairperson Zemedian. Aye. Chairperson Arenas. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. So to continue, um, we are in the middle of the process uh, for the preparation of next fiscal year's budget. The departments have submitted their requests, and in the interest of transparency, we do bring those to the committees. What we ask the departments to do is responsibly develop what they believe their needs are. And then, of course, it's the county executive's office to then take all of these requests and prioritize them, because at the end of the day, we have to have a balanced budget. What's a little different this year is that um, you know, we continue to forecast and look at historic trends, but we didn't ask departments this year to submit reduction proposals. But as the budget picture uh, was further clarified as we go through this months long process, uh, we did learn that um, we do have significant shortfalls. What we're currently showing for the public is a $120 million shortfall. And while we didn't ask departments for reductions, we did have to take actions, including deleting, um, I'll just say, several hundred vacant, and I want to underscore the word vacant positions to help balance the budget. The budget will be published, the recommended budget, on May 1st, which is Monday. It'll be posted to the website, and your offices should sometime that day receive hard copies and potential discs for your own use. The following week, starting Monday, May 8th, and then the 9th, and then the 10th, so that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we have scheduled budget workshops, which is the board's opportunity to review the recommended and provide additional thoughts, comments, directions to the county executive. Because what happens between May 1st, when we have the published agenda budget, and through the hearings, which are June 12th, 13th, and 15th, where we have the hearings, I call it the board's budget modification process, where you're taking the county exec's recommendations and then putting what I'll describe as your finishing touches, and then it gets adopted. Uh, there'll be a second reading, because uh, we have salary ordinance changes, for example, that require two readings. So that would happen at the last um, June 27th board meeting before the close of this fiscal year. And what I'll say is that, um, during this tenure of the county exec, which is you know approaching 14 years, uh, we've enjoyed unprecedented growth. And in my 34 years in public service, I haven't seen, witnessed this, this long period of growth. And so now with this board, and it will be new for this board, we are pivoting to this period of where we're gonna have to have retrenchment, which is what I'm accustomed to being in public service. And as I said, our initial um, forecast is 120 million, and um, that, that number is likely to change. We have to have an organizational conversation about how we're gonna manage that in the next fiscal year. Uh, that is certainly a change, and we're trying to communicate that to the organization because it has been quite a long period of growth. And so now we're gonna have to be much more thoughtful with respect to how we manage the relative priorities. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna suggest we start with Consumer Environmental Protection Agency and move um, towards um, planning and development. The Office of Supportive Housing does not have budget proposals in this document because its proposals are part of the County Executive's Office, um, and those are presented in Finance and Government Operations, which is why you won't see their proposals here. So unless you have any specific questions, I'm happy to turn it over to Mr. Nolasco to present the Consumer Environmental Protection Agency budget. 
Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair Smitting. My name is Edgar Nolasco, your agency director for SEPA. So SEPA is probably the most unique, one of the most unique agencies in the department. It preserves and improves the health and safety and environment of the community. SEPA is made up of two budget units, vector control and uh, AEM 262 and 411. Uh, budget unit 262 has a 7.7 .7 million dollar budget with vector control being about 8.5 million. Uh, with a combined total budget of 16.2 million, uh, SEPA in total has 136, excuse me, 136 full-time team members, 97 of those in the AEM side and 39.5 in the vector control side. Uh, SEPA is made up of nine major functions or departments, if I may say, as part of the agency. Agriculture, weights and measures, animal services, watershed protection, household hazardous waste, weed abatement, waste, uh, integrated waste management, vector control, weed abatement, and UC cooperative extension. SEPA uh, is funded through a unique mechanism, a com combination of special revenues and general fund. The vector control is a special district under your board, and that is funded through a special tax assessment um, and it does not include any general fund resources. Uh, this is my first time as, your, as a director here in Santa Clara County and it's been a unique experience and I really thank the CEO's office and OBA with uh, providing me guidance on creating this budget and this budget was, uh, was a unique opportunity to highlight some of the areas that SEPA really needs to focus on. One of those major areas is the Animal Services Center. This year, we took in more than a thousand more animals than we usually do from year to year, mostly in the large breed of dogs. Um, as you may know, with COVID and other economic factors, people are moving around areas as a lar large dog breed owner, getting an apartment or getting a rental with a large breed dog, it is very difficult. So most of those animals end up being in shelters and cannot you know, accompany their owners. Costs um, are a are big, are big uh, eyesore for, for animal services as inflation hit animal services really hard. The number of pets that have increased the cost of food and the cost of medicine. So as part of our budget request, we did um, ask for more personnel, more team members in order to provide a more welfare to those animals, but also keep the animals in a, in a capacity where they can be uh, open for donation and rehabilitated for them to be donated. Um, other major departmental initiatives, um, unfortunately this, like last year, uh, our vector control team identified an Aedes aegypti, which is an invasive mosquito. And I won't bore you with all the nasty stuff that mosquito brings, but. Please, okay. please, because I am a uh, ideal uh, victim of mosquitoes every season, so I'd love to learn. Yeah, so the Could the chair, if I might interrupt briefly. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yes, Peggy. Um, I need to make an announcement that Vice Chairperson Simidian left his seat at 11.30 a.m., mm -hmm. and the meeting is adjourned, although reports will continue. Thank you. We can take it offline, the mosquito bit. Nobody else needs to know unless they're victims of <laughs> mosquito bites. So it is the jib tie we're hoping it does. It's, it's, it's an invasive mosquito in nature. It's been established in other counties, especially in Southern California. We're hoping it doesn't get established here. We're, we're uh, combating and making sure that doesn't happen here, but more to come with that. Other initiatives are the new water pollution prevention requirements established in 2022 by the North County Watershed Protection Area, and there is a Southern County Protection Area Watershed Program as well. We are split up into two uh, watershed districts, um, also um, SB 1383, and uh, last year was the first year of the implementation of SB 1383, and we're gonna do a lot more things when it comes to our integrated waste division, when it comes to SB, SB 1383. Um, and another focus area for us was, um, SEPA did go through a reorganization, so a lot of folks are, are adjusting to what is the new SEPA, um, and a lot of our team members were deployed as part of disaster service workers. So bringing, bringing folks back to the new reality, uh, really engaging on employee morale. 
and engaging employees on how to best be part of SIPA. And I'm open to any questions, Madam Chair. Uh, no questions. Um, well, actually, no, yes, I'm lying. I do have a question. I know that uh, some of our members from South County have concerns about the lack of doctors in the animal shelter, um, and that um, has also limited the number of spayed and neuter that people can bring. And there's, as you know, there's a lot of advocates who on their own time bring um, a lot of cats or dogs, especially of the unhoused community, to spay or neuter. And, um, and those are being limited. And so I'm wondering, um, I, I think, I think I saw there is an additional request, but I wasn't sure if it was specific to South County. Is there anything that you are specifically augmenting um, for South County Animal Shelter? Yeah, our Animal Services Shelter services the entire unincorporated county. With additional, we have contracts with the City of Morgan Hill and the City of Gilroy. We have one dedicated veterinarian, Dr. V, and she is amazing, and she is a busy bee. Mm -hmm. We do have other vacancies um, in the veterinary. We do have those positions. And unfortunately, we haven't been successful recruiting for them. ESA is in the middle of doing a salary adjustment for them, and we're hoping that is successful. Um, our Animal Services Commission did uh, submit a report also on those findings and support of increasing those salaries. Unfortunately, uh, we are not able to compete with the private sector. Uh, my colleague, Lisa Jenkins, is our animal services manager. Her and I have sort of taken a concierge approach to recruiting um, mm -hmm. and trying to recruit folks here um, that are really passionate about making a difference in animals. Um, and we're hoping we're successful this year with acquiring more veterinarians so we can make a greater impact uh, to providing uh, veterinarian care in the South County. That, that's wonderful, and I'm glad you're taking that concierge approach. We, uh, at the city of San Jose, we also had a lot of issues hiring and, and then maintaining people on board. Um, but there's a lot of passion for, for our animals, and so hopefully we'll find um, additional people. So there's three full-time folks that you're asking for? An additional full-time? Uh, the request was for a full-time registered veterinarian technician and five part-time animal service assistants to help with the day-to-day -day care of all of our animals. Uh, the more animals that we have, we believe, is the more personnel that are needed in order to keep them in a rehabilitated state for them to be donated. Also, with um, Deputy Executive uh, Gallegos' leadership, we're trying to take a different approach on animal services and really you know, reach out to the community to, to have them, you know, there, it's a multi-pronged approach, you know, m more spaying, more neutering, less animals, but also, mm -hmm. you know, utilize the community to be part of the solution, and we're hoping to engage others as well. Okay, so maybe we can take this offline and see how we can integrate what our folks are doing in South County uh, to actually help and so that they don't feel hopeless or frustrated um, and continue to volunteer and bring in those animals themselves um, because that's kind of they're filling some of the work that that uh, we should be doing on our own right yeah. so uh, anyways I, I really appreciate the work that you're that you're doing thank you thank you madam chair with that we'll um go to parks and recreation department um don roach the director is not here but josie reddick is representing the department Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I better put my glasses on. The Parks and Recreation Department manages an over 52,000 acre park system, including the operations, education, and recreational programming and maintenance of 28 regional parks, capital investments and preservations and protections of historic, cultural, and natural resources for this and future generations. The anticipated operating and capital expenditure budget for the department for fiscal year 24 is 97 million. This number reflects the base budget and the department's proposal. With this request, the department would have 253.5 coded positions and typically adds around 80 seasonal extra help support each year. Uh, the majority of our park funding is provided by the Parks Charter Fund, first established in 1972. This is a voter approved set aside to the existing property tax assessment. 
Fiscal year 2017-28 was the latest renewal providing for a 15-year park charter extension. Uh, the charter fund allocations go 80% towards our operating fund, 10% towards capital, and 10% towards land acquisition. Um, we also have additional funding sources, including revenues from fees and charges, leases, grants, and other contributions. Our, um, the, this request, the department continues to focus on repair, re rehabilitation, and improvement of existing facilities and amenities versus major expansion of new services. This budget request focuses on prioritizing capital investment, addressing our aged infrastructure, enhancement of existing programs, planning and implementation of sustainability measures to improve climate resiliency, and expand accessibility and equity to serve the diverse population of the county. Uh, the department is committed to an inclusive and equitable park system that provides extraordinary customer service and ensures that it meets the needs of the county's population to enjoy. Capital investments to address aging infrastructure, deferred maintenance, and historical buildings. Um, enhancing marketing and outreach programs to reach underrepresented and underserved communities to the regional park system, including a new interpretation and outdoor traveling van to bring into different communities of Santa Clara County, essentially taking the parks out of the communities directly, out, sorry, out to the communities directly, especially those communities typically underserved by the county parks. Let me just add a couple of additional thoughts. So one is, I was really proud because during the shelter in place that took place in March of 2020, the only place people could go mm -hmm. was our county parks. And at that time, we waived the entry fee and we saw this explosive growth um, of people finally, not finally, um, new visitors right. who enjoyed our parks. And I think we've seen that continued, you know, once they um, got to participate, enjoy our assets that they have continued. But it was, uh, I don't know if you remember that period, but people were oh, going stir crazy. <laughs> and it was, apart from walking in your neighborhood, it was really the only thing you could do because other park systems were closing their parks. So I'm really proud of that. And then um, secondly, and we really wanted to put a fine point on the work that department is doing in terms of equity, racial equity. They have this team internal, I don't remember their name, Don could tell you as you could okay. Josie. It, we call but, it the Parks Equity Action Team. Yeah, they're really richly and in a granular way trying to figure out how we can in fact embrace it and have it part of the fabric of the organization. So just one minor example is we have, I think, 28 regional parks? 28. Thank you. Um, some charge a use fee, others don't. And we're trying to look at that through an equity lens to make sure that, for example, like we have Hellyer Park, one of our urban parks in East Central San Jose, to make sure that there's um, equity so that, you know, in parts of of the county where you know people are resourced to be able to pay you know the what I view as a rather nominal fee that there is that we are looking at that and I believe because I've asked the director to bring forward a proposal so that we can show that so for example um, Rancho San Antonio in West Cupertino where I live we don't charge that fee and um, but other parks we do we, and Technically, you can get to, into all our parks for free. Every park has an entrance that does not require some sort of thing. It's the parking entrance fees for some. And usually, uh, our standard of care for that is a park. We charge a parking entrance fee, not for a parking lot or a bathroom, but for other enhanced amenities, such as that has group campsites, it has campgrounds, it has um, um, picnic sites, it has other things than just trails and open space. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones that kind of reach to the level. And to include, we are also currently doing our, we have to occasionally do a fee study. And so we are looking at our fee study and cost recovery plan and all of that stuff. And that'll of course come through all of the commissions and boards that it needs to come through. But we're looking at that, and that entails doing a research of all the other areas around us and make sure we're doing that. But to Sylvia's point, we really are trying our best to make sure every bus business decision we make in parks has a equity and access lens so that we are not making 
arbitrary business decisions that could unintentionally make okay. someone not come, not be able to come to parks. Right. Again, like we would like the van to take it out so that we can show people, bring parks, make it not, because we're regional, so we're not easy to get to all of the time. So we're really trying to enhance those services. With that, we will um, have Mr. Freitas from Roads and Airport Department present on both parts of his uh, Yeah, agency. good morning, actually. There's a, there's a, I was counting him up. Uh, Harry Freitas, I'm the director of the Roads and Airports Department. Um, so yeah, we have uh, multiple budget units in the department. Uh, we're not supported by the general fund. Uh, all our funding essentially comes from special funds. So the roads, the roads department, which is historically referred to as the roads department, the road fund is $80 million. And that comes from state gas tax grants, fees and charges. The airports is now um, $6.7 million airport enterprise fund. Uh, that's funded solely by airport user fees. And then there's a separate um, separate fund for airport grants, um, which we still take in San Martin. We have Sanitation District 2-3, which is um, a special district. Um, under special district rules, we collect um, funding on the tax rolls. That's $6.6 .6 million. And then we have the County Lighting Service Area, which is a half a million dollars, um, also funded um, via the tax rolls. We have 260 personnel in the department, uh, about 250 in roads, and uh, we have 259, um, 247 in roads and 12 in, in the airports. The airports is small, hmm. uh, relatively speaking. Um, you know, the services that we provide uh, mostly um, revolve around uh, paving and maintenance. That's the majority of what we do in our department. Um, that's the most important thing we do to maintain our infrastructure, to reduce the ultimate cost to the county. This county does not s uh, support the road paving operation with the general fund. And that's not true all over California. So uh, it's important that we keep our assets in good shape so that um, we maintain the public's investment in that 660 miles of roadway that we maintain. Um, the themes that we have right now, um, I uh, was asked to think about um, some of the themes outside of our um, budget proposals. Um, revenues are generally flat, and part of that is because gas tax, while recently increased in California, is, um, is a per gallon tax, not ad valorem. So when you're dealing with per gallon taxes and the consumption of gasoline is basically going down because of fuel efficiency and electric vehicles, um, and even though the cost of gasoline is going up, it really doesn't reflect in you know, our budget. And um, the cost of goods and services and personnel are all rising, right? And uh, you know, while sources of capital funds are available, which is often the case, in, particularly in Santa Clara County with special funds, uh, Measure B, there's always money to build new shiny things, but we never have enough to maintain the things that we've built. So that's a recurring theme in California, right. in the US, uh, and um, here. And then um, and a particularly um, kind of, um, you know, let's say vexing problem that we've been dealing with probably increasing over the past decade has been dumping homelessness and trash removal. Um, the trash and dumping uh, load on our roadways is um, increased, I, wouldn't, I don't wanna use the word exponentially to, ex, um, to exaggerate it, but it's increasing more than linear. <laughs> so let's say exponentially. I don't know if I'd go that far. I think that, that no, number, that goes straight okay, up in the air. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a serious problem, and, it, and it's becoming um, really a drain on our um, ability to provide the services, um, you know, the, the maintenance services that I've talked about. So that concludes my remarks. I'd be glad to ask, answer any questions. And you saw with the recent storms, roads presenting, you know, both between January and March, it's... It's, I think, I think what you've said, Mr. Freitas, is that that's depleted our reserves in order to make the investments to repair the roads, the mountainous roads that you saw in the presentations, I think in January and March. So we're gonna have to, you know, getting back to the climate crisis presentation, we anticipate more extreme weather events, mm -hmm. severe droughts, but also uh, wildfires. And then when it gets denuded, you start to see these debris flows. And as we witnessed this last winter, impacts to our, um, our roadways. So that's something we're having to think about how perhaps we can get in front of these impacts in the future. Yeah, thanks for um, plugging that in. Actually, I should have, should have mentioned that that is a theme um, that policymakers 
uh, that, that really does impact our department. And you know, um, extreme weather is a good term for it because the climate issues you know, get into kind of a different arena, but the intensity mm -hmm. of the hot weather, the fires, and then the intensity of the rainfalls and the moving water, and it's just that extreme is causing stress on roadways. And I'd say, um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm moving away from my, uh, but I'd say, again, California-wide problem. A lot of the themes that we're experiencing here are things that you see all over California mm -hmm. and the West. Thank you. And, yeah. and have we seen, like, from, from the state or federal uh, government any special funding as we're all recognizing these issues are coming from the environment, not necessarily specific to one region. I, I haven't seen them as far as investing in infrastructure resiliency. Um, you know, the federal funding is mostly oriented towards very large things. And, uh, you know, the federal government likes to fund big things, and these are a lot of small things that add up. The American Investment and Recovery Act um, was not around local roads. It didn't mm -hmm. have anything really to do with local roads. Um, uh, state funding, I, I can't really say that, you know, of course, you know, the feds come in and they, they pay you to fix it after it breaks in, in the form of FEMA, right, and Cal OES. Right, yeah. they're not to maintain it. Well, you know, we have a responsibility to probably start pushing um, and we will be doing this, pushing some of our discretionary uh, decisions on maintenance into the resiliency um, of the areas of the roads that are prone to failure. And what I'm referring to mostly is where creeks cross under roads and in pipes, culverts, you know. Um, a lot of our roads, just as all over California, were built over 100 years ago, particularly the county roadways are very different yes. than the urban roadways because mm -hmm. they're in the hills. Right. They were often built under substandard conditions and then, you know, widened over the years. So you, you start, you get out of those urban subdivided streets that were built with modern techniques. Yeah. And we have, all counties have a big portfolio of those types of roads. Yeah, yeah, we certainly see them in District 8, especially during the floods or the, the rainy seasons. Yeah. And, and Aborn going all the way up, or just a lot of hillsides. Yep. They're just damaged, but, and culverts mm -hmm. being probably maybe the reason. I don't know technically why, but because there, there's more weakens. water than the pipe can hold. Right. And just as Sylvia said, there's just a lot of debris coming off the hills right now because of the fires. In the fire-prone areas, the hills oh. get denuded, and the debris from the fire, you know, it might be coming from, you know, two miles away, tumbling Something down the hill. Something you don't think about. Yeah. So, well, you know, the county does take efforts to, to correct that. So for in mm -hmm. the CZU fire, the county did a lot of work with FEMA to help the local landowners, not just the roads, but the, the hills above, to do debris removal work and erosion control. I think I've taken up a lot of time, so I, I don't want to belabor that. But, yeah. Well, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in learning how we can continue to support our um, roads because, as you know, District 1 is the largest district, and it has, uh, it has a lot of unincorporated areas. And, um, and within that is all the streets that are just unkept. Um, and so it, it would be great to learn how to support the, the department, um, whether it's through reserves or... Uh, now, I'm not going to put this out there, but I'm going to put this out there. You know, the city did a, a Measure T for public safety streets and whatnot. Um, and I don't know if it's that time for the county to do something the same, um, because if the, it, the problem's just gonna get worse, and we all know this. Um, so we can take the conversation. You would get that. an emphatic endorsement by <laughs> the roads and airport department. <laughs> The question is, as you know, with all the competing, you know, Measure know. A for housing, you know, it's up for but, renewal. But as you know, that the, the public safety um, and streets and transportation will always pull very well with our community when, uh, when they're, they're willing to tax themselves when it has to do with public safety. And so I think that's how um, Measure T was packaged and um, just Putting it out there, we can we can take it offline and, and talk about it. But I think it's it's something that 
uh, a particular region isn't going to be able to take on, like for example, District 1 isn't going to self-fund. There's just no way. Uh, this is this is a regional issue anyways, and so we should treat it as such. All right. In the interest of time, we're going to be very quick with planning and development, not to oh. sell it short, but we've, we, oh, we're so one sorry. minute past noon, but let's okay. we'll just power through quickly. I'll of course. go very quickly. Our responsibility, Jacqueline Unshano, Director of Planning and Development, our responsibility is to ensure safe construction, quality, quality, sustainable land development, and protect the natural resources through fair and equitable application of our enforcement of our county policies, ordinances, and regulations. We have a staff of 96 coded positions, and we have a budget of $25 million. And do you want me to go faster? <laughs> no. Um, highlights, what we're working on right now is we have the general plan, update the housing element, and we need to update our 1995-2010 general plan. So we're gonna be embarking on that update some of the elements that we that will follow the housing element is the safety and environmental justice element, and then we'll look to um, begin a work plan for our general plan update. We have some large projects that are coming through. The Stanford Community Plan update is um, associated with our housing element, and then the Sergeant Ranch Quarry development application also in the South County area is coming through. and the Lehigh Quarry we're processing as well. As far as our initiatives, we are working to develop our staff. We're coming out of a transformation modernization program where we're, we embarked on a new um, platform for permitting, our Excella platform. And so we're working through our policies, processes, programs, and procedures, and developing our staff so that they mm. can implement uh, shorter times in our responses for our permit processing. Thank you. Music to develop, or, to, or to, to my ears and to the ears of those who want to develop and continue to <laughs> maintain our, our county. So thank you so much for the work. And that's it for this uh, item. So I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Thank you so much, for everyone, for your participation. And we'll see you at next month's meeting. Thank you. What happened? Yes, I took him. He he got there three hours ahead. <laughs>